So the first thing I want to do is give you a reference for this talk. Let me remind you that the title is Matroids and Log Concavity. So here is the reference, archive, if you don't know what this means, that's part of what you're going to, what you, that's a takeaway from this uh, program for you already. It's a long title and there are four authors. Liu, I, I probably can't even pronounce their names properly. Gharan or Gheron, I don't know. Vince Vincent. Okay. And uh, let me also say that the work of Jun Ha who, is, uh, who's, uh, who was awarded the Fields Medal uh, earlier this year. His work, we will not go anywhere near that, but uh, that definitely is something that uh, uh, is in the background, uses techniques from algebraic geometry specifically singularity theory and Hodge theory uh, to solve long-standing problems in combinatorics. So that the, the main theorem that we are going to state today is has been long standing about 50 years and uh, June Ha proved it and with along with many co-authors but he's the sort of central person around whom the whole thing revolves uh, if I understand things right um, so they they you know this was a uh, fantastic thing to do, no wonder he was awarded the Fields Medal. Uh, however, we, the, uh, the proof that we are going to talk about today is very elementary. I mean, it doesn't, it's at the level of uh, second year college mathematics. Okay. Okay. This, so, uh, by the way, I'm no expert in this subject. I just, uh, uh, I'm also trying to read the proof. And uh, we are all, uh, uh, we are all e equal here, I mean experience doesn't help because it's, a, it's an advanced calculus proof. So, uh, you know, all of us are equally good at it. Okay, so um, let me start with some definitions. I'm, I apologize for throwing these definitions at you to begin with, but these are, uh, these are necessary for what we're going to say, it will become efficient. The language is absolutely necessary, so let me do it. So let's define metroid. So this is a term that's very simple to understand and it deserves to be better known, but isn't. For example, I didn't know the definition myself. Um, I, know if, I think many colleagues will agree that they've heard about it, but are not quite sure what, what it means. Okay, so here, but it's a very simple definition. I think you should all just absorb it now. And, uh, so, so here is a definition. So it's a, so you have a finite subset, which we will denote n without loss of generality. We'll enumerate. So this stands for the set of the first n positive integers. So certain collections of subsets. So I'm not going to write full English sentences, uh, but uh, so I hope you're okay with that. So these are called independent subsets. OK. 
okay, and they, they must satisfy some axioms. So, what are the axioms for these independent subsets? Okay, so before I even state them, let me um, give you an example of this metroid. Okay, there are two examples to keep in mind, um, and these are one is from linear algebra, another is from graph theory. Okay, um, so here is uh, the example. So you take an m by n matrix. So I take n columns. Okay, this n is that n. Okay. And say with entries over any field you want, but let's say, say real numbers, the most familiar field. Okay? okay. Now I call a subset of 1 through n independent if the corresponding columns are linearly independent. Okay, I fix as m by n size, right? So that is an example of a metroid. Okay? So that's, a, that's an example of independent sets. Let's uh, subsets. Let's see what axioms they must satisfy. One is, uh, this is partly maybe convention, the empty set is always there. Okay? So empty set, so, so let's call this collection, 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 not collections of subsets, collection of subsets, collection I, let me call it, give it a name, I for independent. Okay? So the empty set belongs to I. That's one axiom. Okay. Then, uh, surely, if a certain set of columns is linearly independent, then any subset is linearly independent as well. Okay. So the the um, so if I is contained in J, and J is independent, then I is independent. Okay. And finally, uh, the, okay, so suppose I have three columns that are independent and another f five columns that are independent, okay, three columns that are independent and I am also given five columns that are, that are independent, these five may include these three, may not include these, these three, does not matter. A set of three columns which is independent and a set of five columns which is independent. Okay. Then from your linear algebra, you would know that there exists out of these five columns, you can choose one column and augment the three columns and still keep it independent. Okay. So let me write it. So given i comma j in i with the cardinality of I, I being strictly less than the cardinality of J, there exists J in J not in I such that I augmented with this J is linearly independent, is, is independent. Okay? So what I am saying is that it is clear from very basic linear algebra that they, if I take this example, that is an example of a metroid. Okay? Is that clear? Any questions on that? All right. Okay. So let us let me give you another example. Uh, but before I do that, maybe one more. Um, Thing to mention is uh, so from it is very easy to prove from this. Okay, in fact, you should do it now. I suggest you do it now that all maximal independent sets have the same cardinality. So, easy observation observe all maximal with respect to inclusion, maximal independent sets in I because of this. If something has lesser dimension, lesser cardinality, you can augment it and therefore this is not, this is not maximal anymore. If, 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 it has, if it does not have the highest cardinality, it is in maximum. Okay. So all maximal sets in I have the same cardinality 
or have the same size and this size uh, okay let's give this metroid a name m and this uh, cardinality is called rank of m in our example it would be the rank of the original matrix okay so the rank of the corresponding metroid is nothing but the rank of that matrix okay right okay let's let's do here is another interesting example okay so you take a graph okay i'm not going to de define graphs very precisely but they contain a set of vertices and there are some edges between these vertices okay now with finitely many let's just take it with finitely many vertices and also edges okay it's important that i am i say that why it has finitely many edges because i am going to allow so this is not what is called a simple graph allow loops and multiple edges that's okay okay so you could so i'll i'll draw an example a little later okay so what what so, so the let, uh, let n be the number of edges so i'm i'm go, so my basic this set is the set of edges i imagine it to be the set of edges and when do i say they are independent well when i draw those edges in the subset there must be no cycle okay so there must be no cycle so uh, independent sets of edges a set of edges is independent let me just shorten it to end if there is no if it contains no cycle these things are easier to imagine than to write out very precisely if it contains no cycle okay let's do in fact let's do an example i want to take this simple looking graph okay and those are my edges okay now let's enumerate so i can i can make the metroid right it's a collection of subsets of 1 through 5 okay so what would be can you tell me the collection so let's write out subsets with zero elements how many subsets are there with zero elements no elements well the empty set that's the only one okay so that that's the empty set how many sets with single element with one element five because you can take any of the edges okay but observe that if the edge were a loop i wouldn't take it just in this example there are no loops but if it was a loop then it would be a cycle so you wouldn't take it okay good so five uh, one element subsets five of them right all singletons right two elements why is yeah correct why why five choose two correct five choose two there is no i mean no if i take any two they still don't form a cycle very good that's five choose two which is 10 okay three element subsets not quite 10 we 
because phi 2 3 is 10 is the same as phi 2 2 but you, if they form a cycle you cannot take it. Eight. 8 is right. So, the ones you cannot take are 1, 2, 5 and 3, 4, 5. Okay? So, total 5 choose 3, there are 10 possibilities, but 2 of them are disallowed. So, what you have is uh, 8. Okay? And 4 element and 5 element. How many four element subsets? Uh, which four? One, two, three. If I uh, so one, two, five, four, but that has a cycle. One, two, five is a cycle. Without five would be one, two, three, four, which is a cycle. You can't take any, right? It is zero. No matter what, which four you choose, you will end up choosing a cycle, right? Okay. So it's zero, and surely five elements is also zero. There is only one possibility, but that you cannot take, right? Okay. So let me let me code this in a in a polynomial, okay? So 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 I take one. So let C K. I define to be the number of independent subsets of size of cardinality k, but let me just say size k, size is a smaller more familiar word than cardinality. Okay? C k is the number of independent sets. If I do that and then I take just write C k some variable, let me call it y, y, y k k goes from 0 to n. Let me form that polynomial. Okay? So, what is that polynomial in this case? Can you read that polynomial out for me in this example? How many 0 elements? 1. 1 so it's 1 1 times y to the 0 okay and then 5y right plus 10y square plus 8y cube okay right okay let's So, without further ado, let us state our. So, the claim is so, this is these are the conjectures of Mason dating from, uh, like I said, I am not an expert. In particular, I do not know the history that well. But so, do not this, this may not be 100 percent correct, but dating from somewhere around 1972. So, about 50 years old. Okay. What does it claim? It claims you take this polynomial, take any matroid like this one for example, take this polynomial, right? you take any 3 consecutive ones, right? any 3 consecutive ones like 1, 5, 10. Okay. Then the square of this exceeds the product of these 2. So, here 25 exceeds 10, okay. here 100 exceeds 40. Okay. So, it says C k square for any k, so for any k you can write actually anything, but let me just write that. It does not matter because you, after you go beyond it, things will become 0, so it is still okay. Um, is less than or equal to c k minus 1 times c k plus 1. This is the conjecture. 
So this conjecture. Thank you. Thank you. So you are awake. Thank you. Okay. There's a stronger form of this conjecture. Not only this, see you see that 25 and 10, 140, that left a lot of room, right? It feels like that's not, we are not quite there. There must be something stronger that is true perhaps. And indeed, you can write this. That's the second form of the conjecture. And even better, you can put a slightly bigger uh, number here, more than one, and still expect this to be true. Okay. So let's make some observations. So we there are two terms in the title, matroids and log concavity, right? Matroids we've given examples, we've given the definition. We've even made a uh, conjecture about them. We've seen even seen a conjecture about them. How about log concavity, right? So so what does that mean? This is an example of log concavity. What, that's, so what I mean is, so if I take, these are numbers, po positive integers. So let me take the log of this, both sides, right? If I write it, then it becomes log of ck plus 1, 2 times log of ck plus 1, is beca because log is an increasing function. So it's log of ck minus 1 plus log of ck plus 1, ck, thank you, 2 log of ck, okay. Now that is what is meant by log concavity sort of, right. So uh, I, will, I will make it more precise, but if something in the middle which is k, right, the average of that. Uh, sorry, it, it, its value is, so I can take this two on that side and the one in the middle is more than the average on, of the other two, right? The one in the middle is more than the average of the other two, exceeds the average of the other two. So that is what you call log concavity, okay? So the, uh, this is called concavity. But if I take ck, ck minus 1, ck plus 1, they are, you cannot say they are concave, but rather they are log concave in the sense that their logarithm is concave, okay? So log concavity is nothing very uh, uh, exotic. It is something we know. It is concave, we know, right? Concave a function is, if you know a smooth function is concave if its second derivative is negative, right? concave in the sense of facing down, right, okay. So uh, log concave just means if I take the logarithm of the function, then it is concave, as simple as that, okay, okay. Now let us rewrite this last one, the strongest form. Note that these are successively stronger ones, okay. So if we can manage to prove this, then no need to discuss these at all, right. Let us rewrite this in a slightly different form, more suggestive form, okay. <coughs> so before doing that, let me ask you very quickly, suppose I take an n by n matrix over real. 
uh, randomly. Okay, I'm not going to define what that means, but intuitively it's clear what happened. I take it, I take a random n by n matrix and form the corresponding metroid. Okay, how many independent sets in of size k will it have? Random matrix. Okay, let me ask you a question. Suppose I take a random matrix, you expect it to be invertible or not? Are most matrices invertible or are they singular? What is your what is your feeling? It's invertible. Huh? Somebody, I hear too, somebody is voting for singular, somebody for invertible. Okay, they are invertible because the determinant being 0 is a kind of closed condition. You, if you draw the picture of the determinant equal to 0, that is a very thin kind of, meaning it is a, it's a much smaller dimensional object sitting in a bigger dimensional object. Okay? So, so, you, so, in a random matrix, you expect any choice of columns to be linearly independent. Okay? So, how many so, if I choose, if I want to choose k, size k, I choose any size k, which is n choose k, right. So, the size of, if I draw, if I write this for that choice, it will be 1 plus n choose 1, y plus n choose 2, y square plus dot dot dot, n choose k, y to the k plus dot dot, ok. So, keep that in mind. So, I will rewrite this now. I am going to, so this is k. So, uh, you can write it like this. Uh, this is elementary. So, this can be rewritten as c k square c k by n choose k square is bigger than or equal to c k minus 1 n choose k minus 1 times c k plus 1. So, maybe I should write k plus 1 first k minus 1 next, k plus 1 here, k minus 1 here. Okay, let me this is just an easy way of rewriting this. Okay, and you see in this example all these numbers will become 1. Okay, that so that is kind of a motivation for writing that. Okay? So, the conjecture finally is given any matroid, given any matroid and form this polynomial, it will have this property. Okay? This is called, this is, this was log concavity, this is called ultra log concavity. So, this is called Mason's ultra log concavity and the theorem for the day for this talk is that this theorem is true, this conjecture is true. So, theorem for which in the paper that I gave the reference of the four authors have given a elementary proof of this statement is that this ultra masons ultra log concavity conjecture is true. So, I have this here. So, let us just check that. What does it mean if I take 5 divided by 5, right? 10 divided by 10. Right? So, this becomes 1, this becomes 1, this becomes 1. So, 1 square is bigger than equal to 1 times 1. Okay? Let us do it here, here and here. Here I divide by 5, I divide by n choose 5. 10 I divide by 10. So, these two are 1. What about this? 
what should I divide here by? 10, right? 5 choose 3, right? So if I divide that, I will get 4 by 5. So 1 into 4 by 5 is less than or equal to 1. The square of this, this again I divide by 10, I get 1. 1 square is bigger than or equal to 1 into 4 by 5. That's what that says. Okay, which is which we have verified in this. Okay. Okay, maybe this is a good time to stop and ask you if you have any uh, questions. Okay, let's proceed. Uh, you, you feel free to stop any time and ask. No problem. Okay, now let's get a little more into uh, how they prove this. Okay, so the, the key concept is something called completely log concave functions. So this is, a, this is a term that they have introduced, right? So you, I mean people, you, you should not think that mathematics just you can make whatever definition you want. Of course you can, but for, pe for it to be accepted, it has to make sense and you have to prove a theorem, right? So, for, so this uh, is a sort of, this, uh, this uh, definition is justified because they have used it effectively to prove this theorem. Okay? So this is a new definition that they have given. It's not, it's mm, maybe at most uh, five, six, I mean 10 years old perhaps. It may have been in the, um, you know, people may have been thinking about it perhaps, but it's a very, very recent definition. Okay. So, uh, so let me state the theorem in, in uh, from which this theorem is obtained. Okay? So they prove this, that's correct and that's sort of the motivation, but they prove slightly, uh, you know, a slightly stronger result and so let us state that. Okay? So what you do is the following. So this is called, um, so let me shorten this to CLC, okay. So the claim is the independence CLC polynomial of a metroid, I will define this, sorry, the, sorry, I made a mistake independence polynomial in poly of a matroid. So, uh, it has this following notation. Let me introduce the notation of a matroid. I will presently uh, say what these are. Of a matroid uh, is completely log concave. That's the thing. Okay, so let's see what this. Of course, I, I haven't yet told you what completely log concave means, but let's see what this polynomial is. Okay, so what is this polynomial? <coughs> so Z stands for Z1, a bunch of variables. Okay, as many as there are elements in that subset, underlying subset of the matroid. That n will remain fixed throughout the talk. Okay, ah, maybe I'll use it also for R n. But whenever I talk of a matroid, the n is the number of is the underlying set is one through n. Okay, and you have one extra variable y. Okay, so the number of variables, so y, so together there are n plus one variables. Okay, and how do you form this? <coughs> So I'll write it in an abstract way. You have to unwind this. 
for yourself. So given i in i, given an independent set, right? say this was i1, i2, dot 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 i k, some k element subset, by z upper i, I will write z upper i, I mean z i1, the product z i2, z i k. So that is a very simple thing. If I have, I have variables indexed by these elements, so if, if, uh, if an independent set say is 2 and 3 is the independent subset, then I take the variable that I, you know, the, the, the monomial that I take there is z2 times z3. Okay, and so then you what you do is G. So here is the definition. <coughs> you take k from zero to n. Okay, the, the, see the polynomial that we wrote down here. Ah, I should have maybe. Uh, yeah, no, I used the right one. Z. Uh, uh, y. So the polynomial that I. So w what you can write is. Sorry. You can write this. That's a <coughs> that's a good choice. Okay, you can do that. <coughs> uh, but it is better to homogenize it and write like this. Okay, so. So y to the n minus the cardinality of y, z times i. Okay, let's do an example. Okay, suppose I take this graph. So I want to write the independence polynomial of that. What do I write? How many variables do I take? How many? There is one y variable, and how many? Do I take? And here n is three because there are three edges. Okay. So I I write y, z1, z2, z3. What are the independent subsets? List all the independent subsets. So let's call them one, two, three. What are the independent subsets? MT, all singletons, one, two. 3 and all, all 2 elements, 1, 2, 1, 3 and 2, 3, okay. What do I form correspondingly? So I, I need to do this, so 1, so this corresponds to z to the, so there is no, there are no variables corresponding, so it is 1, but I multiply that by y to the power n minus this. Okay, for a minute, forget about this. Let's let's work out the z part. So I'll get one plus z one plus z two. Sorry. One plus z one plus z two plus z three plus z one z two plus z one z three plus z two z3 that would be without worrying about the y for the moment correct these are just each you write one monomial for every independent subset that's what it means that's it very simple the notation is complicated that's all okay but you don't want this you want to homogenize it okay you want to put a y so what y do i put i want i want to make the total degree 3 i to want to make the total degree n so I, I multiply this by y3, I multiply this by y square, so I multiply these 3 by y square and I, and I put a y here, that is it, okay. This is the independence polynomial. Okay, and the claim is the so the theorem is that polynomial 
it's a you know it's a very simple kind of looking polynomial right with integer coefficients and it's 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 very simple you know most of it is like some power of y and a bunch of z's it's a multilinear thing i mean each z occurs only once in every monomial at most once okay very simple kind of polynomial and that has this property which i haven't defined i'm going to do it now okay okay <coughs> so let's come to complete lock on cavity <coughs> So to do that, let me first define for you log concavity. So log concavity So we will most so we'll be considering polynomials with real coefficients. So polynomials in some, some set of variables, finitely many variables, real coefficients. Oh, sorry, non-negative real coefficients, like for example those. Okay, and like that, mostly homogeneous. But right now, don't we'll be thinking mostly of homogeneous things. But our definitions will apply as slightly more generally. Okay. So we consider them as consider these as functions on the positive. Okay, so what I mean is n uh, n variables. So n variables say. So now I'm uh, here. There are n plus one variables. So there is a slight mismatch of convention, but I hope you can adjust. So let's say we are n variables. Okay. So, so here is the definition. F is LC, LC for log concave. If the following hold, first of all, F is non-negative on this. Okay, well, if I am assuming non-negative real coefficients, then this is true. But you can make this make this definition more generally. Suppose you have a function on R n bigger than or equal to zero, and let's say it's a polynomial function, and then if it's non-negative on this, that's the first condition. Secondly, if I so since it's non-negative, I can take the log of that. That makes sense. Okay, so the log. Is a is concave. What does that mean, right? So what this means is the following. So let me draw a picture. So this is example of a concave. Um, so let's, yeah, this is an example of a concave. So if this is u, this is v. Remember these. This is happening in R n. I am drawing the picture in R two. So u, or even in R, u and v. So this is the value of the function. Okay. So the value of the function at some point in between. Okay. So let's call this. So I take a convex linear combination of u and v, which means I take a point here, which is lambda u plus one minus lambda v. Okay. And take the value of the function at that point. That is less than or equal to. Uh, sorry, the the uh, the. Let me write it. So what it means is, this function log of f is concave in the following sense. So if I take log log of f of the middle point, right? That is that must exceed the value here and the value here with this linear combination. So it is bigger than or equal to lambda. So let me write lambda times log of f u plus one minus lambda times log of f. -U. 
So this is the definition of concavity, right? This is the definition of concavity. But so this log of f, this is log of f, this function must satisfy that concavity condition. Okay. Okay. So let me just give you very briefly uh, some examples. As you can see from the theorem, this is a way of generating uh, completely log concave, which presumably we haven't seen that, but which which are more than log concave. Okay. So uh, you can with, you can, for example, this thing that we have produced here is an example of a completely log concave function by the theorem. So, so, so let us just quickly give an example. So if I take the function x on R, right, identity function on, okay, what is its log? So I take the log of x and if you draw the graph of that, that looks like this, right? that is log of x right? and therefore that is concave. You see if I take the value here, the value here and the function is above that line. Okay? So x is an example of a concave function. Okay? How about ax plus b? where since I, I must have non-negative on R bigger than or equal to 0, let me assume B bigger than or equal to 0 and A bigger than or equal to 0. Okay? Let us only consider those. Is this uh, log concave? Well, I need to take the log of that and see. If I take the log of that, you can write this as log of AX plus B which if you rewrite it becomes log of a times x plus b by a which is log of a plus log of x plus b, a, b by a. Now the graph of this is what? You take this graph, you push it up by log a, push it left by b by a, that is what it is. So, you are not changing the concavity of that function. So, it is flat concave. Right? You agree? Okay. So, the next one is uh, I, I, so if I take concave functions uh, and take, if two functions are concave in the sense that their graphs look like this, and add them, that will also be concave. That is easy to, you can work this out. Moreover, if you take any positive, you know, if I take A times the first function and B times the second, as long as A and B are positive or non-negative, that will also be concave. See, if I take negative, what happens is one thing that looks like this may turn around. Once the ones, one that is opening down will start opening up. That you are not allowed to do. But as long as you take non-negative linear combinations, right, you are okay. So the statement is so po positive or non-negative linear combinations of concave functions are concave. So what that means is if f1 through fn are log concave and you take lambda 1 through lambda n all bigger than or equal to 0 some right and I raise it to these powers then f 1 to the lambda 1 dot 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 f n to the lambda n is log concave because when I take the log of this, I will get lambda 1 log f1 plus lambda 2 log f2 and so on. But each of those logs is concave because I assumed f, fi are log concave 
and then that is a positive linear combination of the f's. So, that is concave. So, this is so these are very basic. Okay. Now, so when is a function concave? So, if I draw a function on R R2, so at so the you know concavity, convexity of functions, right? Con concave upwards, concave downwards, etc. What we are defining is concave downwards. Okay, you can define concave upwards as well, but we are talking about con concave one way and that is concave downwards. Okay. <coughs> so, when is a function concave downward? Say I give you some function like sin x, how do you find the points at which it is concave downward? What do you do? What determines concavity? Yeah, I heard somebody say something. Slope will not decide concavity, right? Slope will decide whether it is increasing or decreasing. You could have a function which is increasing but concave upwards or a function which is increasing but concave downwards. Okay, Snow, Slope will not do it, but what will do it? second derivative will do it right so if the second derivative is negative then it is i mean there are some issues with when it becomes zero then you have to check let's not get in get there it's generally if it is negative then it is concave downward if it's positive it's concave upward so since we are talking about con so what must our function satisfy i take the log of that and that must be concave downward which means roughly its second derivative must be negative. This is what we want. Okay, but we are talking about functions in several variables, not one variable. So what might this mean? This means the following: If you have functions of several variables, then there is. You must have heard this term. Is the, what do you do with functions of two variables or three variables? Partial derivatives, but th there is something you form with them. You remember what that is? Second analog of the second derivative, Hessian, Hessian. So it is the Hessian, right? So you form this matrix, the Hessian, which I'll define, and that instead of saying it is, it's a n by n matrix. If you are in n by n uh, n variables, so the correct analog of that is that must be negative semi-definite. I'll again remind you of this definition. So, the, so what we so, um, so, <coughs> so log concave at a point at a point say A means Hessian of log of F so f is log concave f log concave at a point evaluated at a is negative semi definite okay and um, so lc if I want it to be log concave, I'll, I'll define this in a minute. But what, what? So if I want it to be log concave, it is equivalent to log concave at all points. So let us talk about the Hessian. So what is it? So the Hessian Q. Let me write Hessian. I don't know why I write Q. I should have probably written H, but Q is probably standard. So del. So. Uh, it is the general term i j is equal to 1 through n del square f by del what so let me write z 1 through z n are the variables ok that matrix. So, it is an n by n matrix n by n symmetric matrix ok. 
okay and what does it mean for it to be semi definite it means a negative semi definite this means i take this n by n matrix and take z transpose so this is a vector this is a column so i think of vectors as row uh, column vectors 1 through n so this is column z this is row z and q this must be less than or equal to 0 for all z uh, in r n plus so that is what log concavity means ok I am not justifying this but that is sort of intuitively clear ok. So now we come to the definition of completely log concave. CLC. <coughs> so, let me since it is an important definition, let me spell it out a polynomial F in n variables with real coefficients is completely log concave if for every V1 through V k you take a set of points any set of points ok. Uh, you take the directional derivative of this function along this point V k right that is the analog of the derivative but de derivative you can take in any direction. Okay, so, what, you mean, what that means is you take the inner product of the vector v k with the gradient of the function f that is what the directional derivative means right. You take the inner product of the vector scalar product of the vector with the gradient of f okay. and so if when you do this when you do this so suppose I have let us say x square plus y square that is in two variables. If I take the gradient of that, what do I get? Del by del x i plus del by del y j, right. So it is 2x i plus 2y j, right. Now if I multiply it by a scalar vector, or so the, uh, the, uh, the degree goes down by 1, correct. Okay. So if I do this for v k d v 1 this is log concave that is the condition for all possibilities. So, in particular you can take this to be the empty set in which case f itself is log concave that is part of the definition ok. Not only must f be log concave but all its directional derivatives at all possible things must be log concave ok. Now that looks like a strange condition I mean uh, I mean it is I do not know how intuitive it is I do not know it is uh, but the theorem makes it uh, meaningful. So the theorem is saying claiming that if you take a polynomial like that like this in four variables that has this property you not only is it log concave you take whatever directional derivative you want you fix vectors in four dimensions any number of them and take uh, directional derivative of course if you take more than four it's, it has degree what degree three if you take more than three times it is going to become it is going to become zero. So you take once it becomes of degree two it, you take twice it becomes of degree one but you get various polynomials of degrees 1, 2 and that itself of degree 3 all these are log concave that is the claim ok right so, ok. So, let me in the remaining few minutes um, let me give you some idea of the proof of this ok. So, perhaps uh, 
um, since the proof is going to be only yes. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I mean that's cheating. Perhaps I'm using the theorem, but uh, mm, but the theorem gives you ways. Of, that's the uh, I think that's the point that they they looked for properties that this polynomials must have and. I think it is. I think there are some. So although this is the definition, it is uh, enough to differentiate. There are. There, I will mention not quite that, but something that's uh, okay. But good. But the the point is, um, um, it the, the the moral of the. I mean the the idea of the proof is that you can reduce things to the quadratic that seems to be their main idea okay so you uh, just you know you, you uh, i you'll see that's but that's the idea you should keep this in mind right so you you can reduce things to the quadratic case that so the whole that's why the proof is very 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 elementary okay so <coughs> Okay, let's let me first derive. Uh, there are two things for us to do now. First, I have to indicate the proof of why the Mason's conjecture, that polynomial that we wrote down, is has the property C k square, that ultra log concavity property. Assuming that this is completely log concave, right? The theorem, the two one is the ultra log concavity of the uh, CKs, the numbers CK, that is one statement. Now that is a consequence of the main theorem, which unfortunately I raised, which is saying that this independence polynomial is completely log concave. Okay? So we have to do that and the second thing for us to do is look at how to prove the main theorem. Okay, there are two things to do. So let us do, uh, let us first try to assume the theorem and derive the ultra log concavity of the, um, of the coefficient CK. Okay, let us do. So here is a okay, sketch of proof of Masons from CLCness of the independence polynomial GM YZ. Okay. Let us do that. Okay. So, okay, it is good that I have this example. So, here I have this example. So, uh, what does Mason's conjecture say? So, let us see, what do I need to do? I need to, um, there is no, there was only, there was only a y in those, in the CK polynomial. What is the relation between this polynomial and that polynomial? This polynomial, every, every monomial comes with coefficient 1. There the mono, mono, monomial, the y, y to the power had some, right. So what, how do I derive that? Look, there are 3 independent subsets here and corresponding to 3 independent subsets, I get 3 monomials. I do not want this, I want it to become 3. So what can I do? I, I can set all the zis to be 1. So I can get that polynomial by just setting the z i is to be 1. That is the first observation. In fact, I can do the, let me do the following. Let me set all the z i is equal to a z first. So I will get a homogenized version of the 
polynomial with the CK coefficients. Okay, so observe that. So, so G, let's call it G M Y Z. Let me call it is equal to G M Y Z with Z one equal to Z. Z1 equal to Z2 equal to dot 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 equal to all the Z variables you put set it equal to Z. Okay? So for example, if I do that, this polynomial will become y cubed plus 3zy square plus 3y. Sorry, 3 by z square. It should be homogeneous. Okay? And what should be my that other polynomial I put z equal to 1. Okay? But actually I work with this, the CKs are right there. Right? I do not work with the, I mean, I work, I can work with this polynomial, these are, this has the CK coefficients. Right? So I have to show that this square is bigger than or equal to uh, the product of these two with the, after dividing by the corresponding binomial, etc. Okay? That is what I need to show. Okay, now let us look, look at that. So, okay, here is the first observation. So, I mean, this is uh, mm, so how did I get from here to here? I substituted zi is equal to z. So, this is a function on n plus 1 in, in n plus 1 space, this is a function in 2 space. Right? So, how do I think of this function on 2 space in terms of this n plus 1 function? Well, you can take a map from R2 to Rn plus 1 in which the first coordinate is y, it goes to the first coordinate. The second coordinate z goes to second coordinate, there it goes to second coordinate, third coordinate all are the same. In other words, in other words what I am saying is if I consider If I consider this a map, let us say T, right, in which y comma z goes to y comma z comma z comma z, right, it is a very nice function, it is a linear function and I take gm as a function here, this, this function and take the composition that will give me that this this g, right so gm with just the yz is first apply t and then apply this function think of it as a function correct and it's a very it's a very easy st uh, statement to see that uh, I, 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 this is uh, elementary, so let us not, this, there are no ideas here, that if I take a linear, compose with a linear function, so I know this function is um, completely log concave by, by the theorem and I am composing it with a linear function. Okay? It is very easy to see that if I compose, I, you know, if I take a linear function and then a log concave function, it is log concave. If it is, if I take a linear function, compose it with a completely log concave function, then that is completely log concave. Okay? There is a bit of work, but that is not really, that is that's, that's fairly straightforward. Okay? So, what we get is that this function is completely log concave on R2. Okay? So, this polynomial, for example, is completely log concave as a function on R2. Okay? From this, how do I derive the CK inequalities? Well, okay, uh, and this is this is why they use complete log concavity rather than log concavity, because apparently, um, okay, the idea. So let me say the idea. You have all these all these coefficients. How do I just concentrate on three of them? Well, the obvious thing to do is take partial derivatives. If I take correct partial derivatives, so for example, if I take 
uh, second derivative of y, this goes away. And if I take derivative of uh, z, this goes away. So if I take two derivatives of y and one derivative of z, only this remains and everything else goes away. Right? So you can you can concentrate on whatever you want by taking partial derivatives. And our completely log concave is made for this. So if you start with some polynomial which is completely log concave, take partial derivatives, it is co completely log concave. So I get down to uh, just CK that, that three term polynomial which is now completely log concave. Okay? And then uh, I just have to write out the something about the Hessian of that logarithm of the Hessian of that. That's a that's a bit of work, but that's that's elementary. That you can just sit down and do some advanced calculus. Okay, and then lo and behold, this what you want just drops out. Okay, so I'll do that in the next few minutes. Uh, when do I stop? Okay. So let me do that. <coughs> Okay, so let us write this g m y z. So, where are we? This which is c k y to the power n minus k, maybe I had this the other way, does not matter, z k, k is equal to 0 to n. Okay, this is completely log on k. Why is that? I applied the theorem to say that this is log concave and then observe that the, this, this function on two variables is just a pullback so to speak via this linear function of that other function and that see therefore that is also easy to see that it is completely log concave. Okay? Now let me let us work with this function and if I apply so for example I want if I want c k, c k plus 1 and c k minus 1 only. Okay? So, what is the coefficient of y here? Okay, I hope I get this right. So, this is z to the k minus 1. right? Okay. I want to kill off all lower things. So, I take del z to the power k minus 1. Okay? What does it do? It kills off all the ones terms before because those have lower coefficients of z. Okay? And what is the y power here? n minus k minus 1. Right? So, I want to, uh, am, am I doing this right? Or am I, did I get, uh, uh, Yeah, I want to kill off all the, oh, oh no, no, maybe, maybe I should do. So, what is the power of z here please? z to the k plus 1. I want to kill off z to the k plus, no, I am, I am doing this right, okay. So, k plus 1 comes with n minus k minus 1. So, this comes with n minus k minus 1. So, if I take and what is the power here? n minus k. So, if I take the derivative of n minus, please help me here, uh, n minus k minus 1, right? Okay, right. So, if I do that, right, now g m y z. Right? If I do that, this if I if I write it out, there will be some um, some coefficients, some binomial coefficients. All right, let's not worry bother writing it. It will have this term, this term appropriately taken derivative. So there will be this term, this term, and this term only. 
right? It will have C k plus 1 and uh, uh, um, z square something, there will be some other coefficients here which I am not writing down, C k with z y and C k minus 1 with y square, is that correct? Maybe uh, just check that I got it right. Hmm? Okay. Right? There will be some. Okay. The thing is, this is now completely log concave. That's the conclusion. Okay. And from this, I need to derive the ultra log concavity of the. Uh, so for that, what I do is. So. Here is the another key idea, another key idea is that what does ultra, uh, what does, so in particular this is log concave, what does it mean? It means that the Hessian of the log is negative semi definite, that is what it means, okay. But what they do is relate it using so there is a relation between the, so let me relate it to the Hessian of the function itself, not to the log, okay, that is the other idea, okay. So the Hessian of the, so if I take this function, take this polynomial, I am not writing this, this down, right, if I, if I write the Hessian of this, so take this to be Q, okay, whatever with these numbers there, if I take, oh, sorry, like, let us call it F. So, the Hessian of, this is the Hessian of F, okay. So, you take the second derivative, first derivative, etc., right. So, you will get C k minus 1 here, C k plus 1 here with the very conveniently you will get this. So that will be the Hessian, okay. Sorry, I am not writing out the calculations, but this is what you get, okay. Now, the fact that it is log concave will mean that this has negative determinant or less than this determinant. So the claim is, claim determinant of this Q is, and that is good enough, right. That is exactly what we want, okay. And why is that? So here is the idea. So uh, again, I, uh, I wish like in all talks, like all speakers, I also wish that there were more time, but <laughs> um, there are other nice talks to be uh, the coming your way. So, so, so the here is the idea. So, using the ne negative semi definiteness of log of uh, f of sorry. Uh, what is that? The Hessian of the log of f, this is the Hessian of the log of f, okay. So you can show the following, so, so, so it boils down to showing the following. So this matrix, right, this Q, this is the Hessian of f itself, right. So um, there exists vectors, so for a in R2 such that f of A is non-zero, okay. Remember this, this function has positive coefficients. So there is e easy to find f of A such that f of, um, you have A T Q A is positive. 
So if this is not 0, this is actually bigger than 0 because the coefficients are positive. Okay? And zt qz is less than 0 or less. Let's make this um, is less than 0 for z such that it's perpendicular to Q of A. This is the main observation. So, on something it attains negative and on an orthogonal thing it attains positive, you know, it's something it is positive and on an orthogonal thing it attains negative. So, it can neither be semi-definite, uh, neither can be positive semi-definite nor can be negative semi-definite. Okay? So, that forces this determinant to be, uh, rather let me say it this way, it cannot be positive definite nor can it be negative definite. So, it forces the determinant to be less than or equal to 0 and hence uh, this, uh, you get what you want. Okay? About uh, the other part, the proof of the main theorem, okay? I, 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 I will not um, I will just mention to you, uh, let me just mention the reduction to the quadratic case and finish because that is the important step. Is that okay? You check or we are already out of time. Okay. So, I think, I think we'll, we can stop here. Yeah, sure. I repeat that the paper is uh, very readable. It's only nine pages long, and it's absolutely at undergraduate level, and of a recent important result. So that's the attraction. So uh, yeah, if there are no, if there are no questions, maybe we'll we'll stop here and let's thank the speaker.